Okay, so remember that we do have lab today after class at two, and then you'll get your lab notebook back. So I've entered the lab notebook grades into your grading book. And also remember that we have a um, lab, not a lab practical, but we have a midterm exam, excuse me, midterm exam coming up a week from today. So on Wednesday, I'm going to hand out the review sheet for that um, uh, exam, okay? So, um, it is next Monday. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, is it next Wednesday? Okay, sorry. Next Wednesday. Okay. So, my other exam. So, hypothetically, if we like memorize everything on the review sheet that you send out, we should be able to. No. The review sheet just makes sure that you didn't um, forget something. As long as you come to class and you uh, study your notes, that's what you want to do. So, the review sheet is mainly just to make sure that you know it just has everything on it we've covered. It doesn't have a, it's not like a reduced it's amount of highlighted. Highlight. No. So I would be studying your notes. Yes. So, okay. So the midterm is a week from Wednesday and I'll hand out the, that makes more sense. I usually hand it out a week ahead of time. Okay. So, um, the question is, do you guys want a quiz on Wednesday, or would you rather not have a quiz on Wednesday? Okay, so we won't have a quiz this Wednesday. I'd like to take a quiz because no, it's shut up. Because it's helpful because it makes me know. Okay, well, why don't we do like a group quiz then? Okay, yeah. Non-graded group quiz. Because that tells me what you're doing. Or okay. Or Good. But yeah, or quiz or open book quiz. So, that so you don't need to study. We'll just we'll, we'll do just something together. Okay. <laughs> that works. But I okay. need the learning material. Okay. So we'll have we won't have a graded quiz on Wednesday. We'll have a non-graded quiz. Okay. So we were talking about metabolism. And remember that one of the um, important things about metabolism is this is the way we generate energy. And we can generate energy from all different types of molecules. So um, you can generate energy from protein or from lipids. But the example that we're giving is the example of what happens in your body when you take a glucose and use glucose to produce the energy. So remember that glycolysis is where we take glucose and we break it down, and this is the chemical reactions. And you'll notice that these chemical reactions require these molecules right there, and what would those molecules be? What are the, the examples of? These ones right here, they're shown here. Hexokinase, phosphoglucose, isomerase, those are enzymes, okay? So enzymes function to catalyze chemical reactions. So those are the enzymes that are causing the chemical reaction to proceed. Okay, so the enzymes are very much necessary for this uh, metabolic um, process to go forward. Okay. Also, remember that we can generate some energy from this conversion of glucose to pyruvate. And one example of a source of energy is the production of NADH. So remember that when we go from NAD positive to NADH, that would be an example of reduction because reduction is rig, reduction is gaining. So there I'm gaining a hydrogen, right? And so I can actually, or I'm actually storing energy in this molecule, NADH. We also can store energy in ATP. So this, um, this chemical uh, reaction is what is referred to as glycolysis. And so for remember that for every glucose molecule, we produce two pyruvates, and that's through the process of glycolysis. So when we go from glycolysis, we can take one or two different pathways, actually two op different pathways. And so one pathway is called fermentation. And so this is where we take pyruvic acid or pyruvate. Okay. 
And this fermentation does not require oxygen. So it is said to be anaerobic. Does not require oxygen. Okay. So you probably have seen fermentation as a, um, as a source of alcohol. So for example, when we ferment grain using um, a certain type of um, yeast, we can get alcohol, but we also have fermentation in our bodies, occurring in our bodies. And this produces lactic acid. So produces lactic acid. So fermentation can occur in our muscles. And generally, it's in the muscles that are um, responsible for um, fast sprinting type movements, right? Because they are anaerobic movements um, versus those muscle fibers, which we'll talk about when we get into AMP, but those muscle fibers that are responsible for like um, slow, long term contraction, right? So when we look at um, lactic acid, this is a. Um, uh, kind of a waste product that must be broken down. So this can lead to possible fatigue and soreness in the muscles. That's a G. Fatigue and soreness. Now we actually have bacteria in our guts, and we also, if you're female, you have bacteria in your vagina that produces lactic acid. And so um, your uh, vaginal secretions are a source of nutrition for these good bacteria that live in the vagina and secrete lactic acid. And this lactic acid actually keeps the pH of the vagina low, okay? So we have bacteria, which are called lactobacilli, Okay. This is in our gut and in the vagina. And this specifically digests glucose and produces lactic acid. Right. And in the vagina, it decreases the pH. And this actually helps to prevent bad infections, including infections that are caused by yeast. So in general, yeast, um, the type of yeast, Candida albicans, which causes yeast <coughs> infections in females, cannot survive in the low pH. And so that protects it and that also keeps it um, from possibly yeast possibly getting into the urinary tract and causing uh, urinary tract infections. Right? So um, this is a protective mechanism. And so that's the, the type of, so they would take down these bacteria when actually produce hydrobic acid from glucose and then they ferment it and then they release lactic acid and that increases the pH. So this is the same thing that is found in yogurt. So it's found, this bacteria is found in yogurt. So your yogurt has a lower pH, which means that some of the proteins come out of solution. And that's why yogurt is much more uh, thick than say, for example, regular milk, right? And it's also found in, um, found in yogurt and also what I say, oh, acidophilus. So acidophilus is a supplement that you can get, which contains bacteria. So acidophilus has been used by females to try to get over, and also actually also yogurt, has been used by females to try to get over yeast infections, right? So these are considered to be um, probiotics because they have good microorganisms in them. So these are probiotics. 
versus antibiotics, which kill bacteria. And then there's actually now there's a, um, a big discussion about prebiotics. So what kind of food, what kind of nutrients can you actually take into your body to feed the good bacteria in your gut and elsewhere on your body to help um, um, keep the good bacteria fed while decreasing the presence of disease causing bacteria. Okay. Okay. So also, right. I'll just put as an aside here for fermentation, there's also yeast that can produce ethanol. As a byproduct. Right? So ethanol would be alcohol. Yeah, so you ferment the grapes. You produce ethanol, you ferment gra or grains like barley or wheat, then you can get um, alcohol that's found, say, for example, in beer or other hard liquors. Okay, so let's look at fermentation versus, oops. So this is a diagram that actually shows fermentation in your book, right? And so you can see that it does produce some energy. So um, as you go from, actually, does it take energy? Oh, it takes energy, sorry. As you go from the 2-pyruvate NADH, would that be oxidized or reduced? It's oxidized because, remember, oil means oxidizing is losing. And so in this particular instance, it has lost an electron. Right? So the thing about fermentation is it doesn't, um, uh, it's not very efficient and it produces a byproduct. So it doesn't produce as much energy as the next type of metabolism that we're going to talk about, which is called the citric acid cycle. So this is also called or named after the person that uh, first um, figured it out. And so this is also the same thing as the Krebs cycle. So sometimes you see it called the Krebs cycle in certain textbooks. The reason why it's called the citric acid, acid cycle, however, is, is that um, there is an intermediate stage which includes citric acid. And so citric acid is found where? In fruits, right? So it's the same citric acid that's found in fruit is a kind of an intermediate um, when we're breaking down pyruvate and we're producing energy. Okay, so this is aerobic. Oops. He's still aerobic. Ah, aerobic. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking there must be two A's in there, but it's not. Okay, so aerobic versus anaerobic. And so this requires oxygen. Okay. There are some bacteria that can use the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. But in our cells, the only place that the citric acid cycle takes place is in the mitochondria. So it occurs only in the mitochondria. So the mitochondria look like bacteria. They're about the size of bacteria, and they have their own genetic material. And they also have an internal membrane that looks something like this. So this is my picture of my mitochondria. Okay. And this, this uh, membrane that's internal, notice how it has ridges and folds. This increases the surface area over which the chemical reaction we're going to talk about is going to be able to occur. So this, this folding of this membrane, um, this membrane itself is called the cristae. So this is the Chris, oops, Chris Day. That's C-R-I-S-T-A-E, Chris Day. And then inside, we have the matrix. Okay. So if we think about the route that oxygen takes, we breathe it in, right? It goes across the surface of our lungs. It gets picked up by our red blood cells. It's bound to hemoglobin. And then it goes out to the tissues. 
Then oxygen leaves the bloodstream, gets unbound from hemoglobin, leaves the bloodstream, and then it goes into our tissues, then into our cells, and then it ultimately finds its way into the mitochondria. So we'll have, I'm just gonna show oxygen being taken up by the mitochondria, okay? So this is what we talk, talk about as being cellular respiration, and this is the whole reason that we breathe. Cellular respiration. So the byproducts of cell, cellular respiration would be CO2, which is carbon dioxide, plus water. Okay, so these are the byproducts. So pyruvate, pyruvate or pyruvic acid comes in and then it's broken down and the, what is released is carbon dioxide and water. So there is no lactic acid, there is no waste product that has to be broken down further, there's no alcohol, right? So this is not fermentation. The byproducts of the citric acid cycle are just water and, and H2O plus energy, right? So this is going to be able to release energy in the form of ATP. So it is not only breaking down um, the organic molecules more completely, but it is also producing more energy. And so they will say that this is more efficient. So much more efficient than glycolysis. So what comes into the citric acid cycle is pyruvate. But remember that there's actually two pyruvates per one glucose molecule. So that in order for it to break, completely break down one glucose, it's gonna have to go through this cycle twice, right? So I'll put um, two um, pyruvates for each glucose broken down. So the pyruvate, pyruvate needs to get converted to a molecule that is called acetyl-CoA. And if you remember about our discussion of pyruvate, pyruvate actually has three carbon atoms. Acetyl-CoA actually has two total carbon atoms, so it's it, so we're actually getting rid of a carbon. And so we have right off the bat um, a release of carbon dioxide. So CO2 is released when we convert pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. Then acetyl-CoA has to combine with another molecule, another uh, type of molecule, which is called oxa, oxaloacetic acid, oxalo acetic acid and the oxoacetyl acid has four carbon okay. so when we combine those together we have now a six carbon molecule right so that combines and that is going to be what goes into the the um, the uh, citric acid cycle. So this forms citric acid. And citric acid has six carbons. That's five, six, there we go. Okay. So the citric acid is then gonna start going through a cycle and essentially what this does is it cleaves a carbon off, and you have CO2 being released. And so it's just going to start cleaving the carbons off. And remember that we have energy stored in these, in these covalent bonds between the carbon atoms. So as we release a carbon, then we're going to be able to pick up that energy that was stored in this bond, and we're actually going to be able to um, transfer the energy to NADH and also to ATP and also to FAD. 
Okay? So there's these high energy molecules that are going to pick up the energy as we cleave the covalent bonds. Because remember, as we cleave those covalent bonds, the electrons are going to move further away, right? And it's going to release energy. Right? Okay. So actually, they're going to move further in and it'll release energy. Okay, so this is the cycle. So I'm going to put a big cycle like this. Oops. And then we go, sorry, we go back to not citric acid. We go back to this. Okay. So it goes back up to oxaloacetic acid. So the, the, the end of this cycle starts with citric acid and it ends with the oxaloacetic acid. So the first thing that we need to talk about is NAD. So remember that NAD can be converted to NADH, right? So it is um, gaining, so it's being reduced. So that means it's picking up energy. So NADD is being reduced to NADH. And this actually occurs three times. So we have three of those molecules um, being um, reduced. We're also going to um, release carbon dioxide. So there's going to be two of those molecules. So I'll put a little times two. Carbon dioxide is released. And then we're going to um, take FAD, which we haven't talked about, but that's another energy molecule. And FAD positive is reduced to actually FADH2. And then we have ATP. And remember, ADP is its form, and it can pick up a phosphate and produce <coughs> ATP. So this, the whole point of the citric acid cycle is, is that we are transferring the energy between those carbon atoms to these high energy molecules, FADH2, F or NADH, and ATP. Okay, that's the whole point of this. There's only a total of six carbons. Yes, and, and so I mean, there's seven. Okay, so we actually only uh, cleave off two carbons. We don't cleave off them all. So if I take two carbons off right here, then I'm back to this oxoacetic acid, oxaloacetic acid. So that whole process only requires two carbons? Yes. Okay. Yep. So how you only cleave divided, off two. How is it divided up? This um, starts with the citric acid and has six. CO2 is released twice, so there's two carbons there. So these two carbons become right. CO2. So how does the rest happen? All the, all the carbons there. Because then it comes back here and it picks up another acetyl CoA and another oxaloacetic acid. So this turns into oxaloacetic acid. And then it combines with another acetyl CoA. So this has to always, this is always. So it just replenishes itself and starts to cycle yes. over again. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you're just like you're feeding in okay. acetyl CoA. And is it the same? I mean, it doesn't store up. The, I would assume it, it kind of cycles through where the newer carbons come in to join. And it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So if we look at the diagram from your book, this is what I kind of just drew here. Okay. So this is. Um, acetyl CoA being converted into um, the oxaloacetic acid, and then this is the the um, conversion of citric acid. So again, um, this is just a cycle that continues. That's why it's called sometimes a well, it's called a cycle, but it's also called the Krebs cycle, right? Because it's continually we're continually feeding in molecules and getting energy out of it. Okay, so the next part has to do with how do we take NADH and FADH2 and how do we turn that into ATP? And so we have a process which is referred to as oxidative phosphorylation. So oxidative 
phosphorylation. So I have a question. Yes. Does this cycle require citric acid to happen? Would you say is, is food the only place that we get citric acid, or does our body? Okay, so we turn the pyruvate into citric acid. Citric acid is also necessary for other reasons, but it's not because it's not that we're taking it's not because I'm eating fruit. Okay. It's because I'm taking in glucose, right? And you can also convert uh, fats and proteins into molecules that can be fed into this cycle. But the common one is just showing how glucose turns into pyruvate, which then turns into a citric acid and then goes through the cycle. Yeah. That's a little confusing. So that's much more complicated. So our, bo our body does that process. Yes. When we eat the fruit. But we can but, eat anything. So I can But eat. in the fruit itself, if we never ate it, there's still citrus. Yeah. Yes, but that's not where the citric acid is coming from. That is not where our citric acid is coming from. I'm just pointing out that that's the same citric acid that we convert our energy into and feed it into that cycle. Okay. But so is that same process going on in that orange? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, plants have cellular respiration. So plants have photosynthesis and they build sugar and they also break down sugar to produce um, energy. So they have mitochondria. So the plants have mitochondria and they undergo cellular so respiration. So what happens when the, if the orange is already producing citric acid and we eat it, we have to process that all over again? Yeah, so we're probably going to break down the citric acid into smaller molecules and to absorb process the it. energy and then process the kinds that we want. Yeah. Okay, so oxidative phosphorylation occurs because of um, proteins that are found in the plasma membrane of the cristae. So um, if I drew my little picture again, my mitochondria. So this is a plasma membrane, so it's a phospholipid bilayer. And we talked about how important proteins are in that phospholipid bilayer. And so these proteins, are found in the phospholipid bilayer of the cristae. Oops, lipid, phospholipid bilayer of cristae. Okay, so that's what it's showing here. And what these proteins do is they function in transporting electrons. So electrons get passed to the um, proteins and then they transport them in a way that's kind of shown here. And as the electrons get passed, that is a form of energy. So it tends to, the, the transfer of electrons tends to energize these proteins and then they can use that energy to, um, to cause hydrogen to be pumped out. Okay. So let me just write that down. So we have, they're found in the proteins and the phospholipid, okay? Proteins pick up electrons from NADH and FADH2. The movement of electrons is energy. So the movement of the electrons allows the pro proteins to pump hydrogen ions, that's a hydrogen ion, out of the matrix. So you can see in this diagram, the arrows are showing where, how the electrons are being transported. So they're showing two electrons. So it goes from like coenzyme Q, because these all have names, you don't need to know them, but the, the electrons as they move from one protein to another, notice that they're allowing the proteins to pump hydrogen ions to the outside. So what that does is that sets up an energy gradient. So this actually creates potential energy. I'm running out of room here, so we'll put it down here. I'll put this right here, okay? So this is like one, two, three. Okay, so 
So this creates potential energy. When it says the NAD plus and then the plus hydrogen ion, it's saying that that's adding the hydrogen. That's adding another, a new hydrogen ion from inside, right? It's no. So NADH is losing a hydrogen ion, but notice that they have lost their electrons, right? So when NADH loses the hydrogen ion, in this case, it has lost an electron, and the hydrogen ion has lost an electron because they're both positive in this case, right? So those two electrons get transported here. So this is just the conversion. This is just showing the release of the electrons. So NADH um, gets converted to NAD positive plus H positive plus two electrons. Okay. So that's just showing how, the, how this can release electrons. So this molecule is high energy. It can release these electrons. The electrons can then go through what is called the electron transport chain as it moves from one protein to another. So this movement of the electrons is called, so right this this right here is called the electron transport chain. Yes. Okay. What is the electron transport chain? When notice how it goes from this, the electrons are being moved from this uh, protein to this protein to this protein to this protein. Okay, and finally they're released into the back into the matrix. But the movement of electrons is called the electron transport chain. Okay. So the hydrogen ions in the outside are more concentrated. So I'll write a bunch of hydrogen ions here, right? So this is on the outside and this is on the inside. So this would be outside of matrix, still in the mitochondria. This is the inside of matrix. So I've just essentially um, created potential energy by pumping all of these hydrogen ions to the outside, okay? So then this is kind of crazy. We're gonna allow those hydrogen ions to move back in, and they move back in using a chemical which is called ATPA, or ATP synthase, okay? So the last thing that you need to know, the last step, is hydrogen ions move back in. So they flood back in, right, via a protein, which is called ATP synthase. And that's an easy one to remember what its function is because it's an enzyme, right? ACE. Anytime you see the ACE, that means it's an enzyme. Synth means to synthesize, to produce. And this is an enzyme that produces ATP. So this is actually a motor protein. So this actually kind of spins. So as, H2, or as the hydrogen ions flow back in, and you can see it right here in this diagram right here, they flow back in, and then the spinning of this um, motor protein causes ADP to be converted to ATP, okay? So ADP gets converted back to ATP as that motor protein spins. So it's very much like pumping water up and storing it, and then you open the spigot and running through the running the water through a turbine and generating energy. Okay, but we're just doing it at the cellular level. So any NADH that is produced during the citric acid cycle will eventually be converted to ATP. So we produce a lot more ATP. Now the role of oxygen here, 
right? It requires oxygen is, is that oxygen must combine with the hydrogen ions to produce water, right? So the very last step is oxygen plus hydrogen, right? Is going to give us H2O, right? One half H2O, but okay. So eventually, that's not a balanced chemical reaction, but eventually, the oxygen is going to take those hydrogens and convert it to water. So, this is more efficient than glycolysis. So, for every one ATP, Oh, excuse me, sorry. For every one glucose molecule, um, we're eventually going to get 36, about 36 ATP produced. Remember that glucose has to first go through glycolysis, and then pyruvate enters the citric acid cycle, okay? and then we produce a lot of ATP through this process of oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. So we're using oxygen, and we're producing, um, uh, we're phosphorylating ADP, right? So ADP plus a P gives me ATP, and that's phosphorylation, because we're adding a phosphate for two. Okay, so I have a short little video that talks about these electron transport chain and then specifically shows that really cool motor of the ATP synthase. So, Concentration gradients are a key component of the biological world. The potential energy from these gradients is often used to perform biological work. Here we will focus on hydrogen ion concentration gradients. Hydrogen ions are also known as proteins. A gradient exists when there is a higher concentration of a molecule in one compartment compared to a neighboring compartment. This animation will demonstrate how the potential energy that results from a hydrogen ion gradient uses ADP and inorganic phosphate, also known as PI, to synthesize ATP. This process involves an enzyme complex called ATP synthase. Gradients and the potential energy they create are key aspects of the biological world. A good example of the use of a gradient occurs in the mitochondria when ATP is synthesized. ATP is synthesized by ATP synthase, a large complex of membrane-bound protein. Here we see ATP synthase, along with other membrane-bound proteins. Notice the large difference in the number of hydrogen ions on the two sides of the membrane. This difference is a hydrogen ion, or proton, concentration gradient. The energy associated with this gradient is used to synthesize ATP from ADP and PI. This occurs at the ATP synthase complex. One hydrogen ion enters the ATP synthase complex from the intermembrane space, and a second hydrogen ion leaves it on the matrix space. The upper part of the ATP synthase complex rotates when a new hydrogen ion enters. Once three protons have entered the matrix space, there is enough energy in the ATP synthase complex to synthesize one ATP. In this way, the energy in the hydrogen ion gradient is used to make ATP. Now let's watch the process again. Notice how the proton enters the ATP synthase and exits into the matrix space. Once three more hydrogen ions have crossed the membrane, another molecule of ATP will be made. In this example, the hydrogen ion gradient is large enough to produce six ATP molecules. Please watch as the remaining ATP molecules are synthesized.
So it's kind of cool because it's taking the energy from the concentration, differences in concentration gradient. The process has now completed, and the result is an equal number of protons on each side of the inner membrane. Without a gradient, there is no more energy available to make ATP. In biological systems, however, a gradient is always maintained. The mitochondrial hydrogen ion gradient is generated as electrons pass through three membrane complexes. That process can be seen in the mitochondrial electron transport chain animation. So it turns that electrical energy into mechanical energy and then the mechanical energy back into chemical energy, right? So the movement of a charged particle is electrical energy. The movement of the ATP synthase would be mechanical energy. And then ATP is an example of chemical energy, right? So it's kind of interesting that, there, that we actually have these little mechanical motors. And so you can think of just like a turbine, right? Water turning a turbine, right? The energy can be transferred. Any questions about that idea? Okay. So the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, requires oxygen, right? Involves the electron transport chain, right? And produces a lot more ATP than glycolysis alone, glycolysis and fermentation alone. Okay, so we are going to move to a new chapter in your book, and this chapter is on tissues. And you'll remember that when we were talking about the hierarchy of biological organization, we talked about tissues, because this um, is between the idea of cells and organs, right? So cells and organs, when we're looking at the hierarchy of biological organization in terms of complexity, okay? So when we look at tissues, tissues are simply groups of cells with a common structure and function. And when we look at the structure, it follows function, right? So whatever the function of the cell is, if it's protective, we might have many layers of those cells. If things have to move through it, we might just have a single layer of cells and the tissue could be very thin. So we're gonna kind of explore um, the function and the um, structure together. Okay. So we have what are called embryonic tissue layers. So early on during embryonic development, we develop um, three distinct layers. And they are called the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. Okay, so those are our three embryonic tissue layers. These then subsequently develop into different structures, but they start out being endoderm means being inside, mesoderm means being in the middle, and ectoderm means being on the outside. So if I were to draw like an early embryo, it might look something like this. So an early embryo might look like this. So the ectoderm would be the outer layer. The endoderm would be the inner layer. And the cells that are found kind of in the middle here are called mesoderm. And they generally are colored differently. So like ectoderm is, being, for some reason, they standardized it. Ectoderm is blue. So ectoderm would be blue. Endoderm is yellow and mesoderm is red. So if we look at the tissues that are derived from this, for example, the ectoderm in us is the skin and the nervous system. So like our brain and spinal cord are derived from ectoderm. 
The endoderm is like the lining of our digestive system and respiratory system. So like the lining of our stomach, the lining of our small intestine, the lining um, in our trachea and lungs, that is endodermal in origin. And then the mesoderm is like everything else, which would include muscles and connective tissue. But remember that we actually start out as a single cell, and we'll talk about embryonic development, but as those cells divide, right, then um, they find themselves in different places in the embryo, and where they are in the embryo determines what they are ultimately going to specialize as. Okay. So those are the tissue layers. So when we look at the um, body, we can see that there's different tissue located in different places. So for example, our brain and spinal cord is primarily nervous tissue. When we look at our digestive system and our heart, those would be like muscle, muscular, muscular tissue because the heart um, contracts. And we have waves of contraction that go down through our gut, moving the food in one direction. We also have epithelial tissue, which lines the inside of the digestive tract. And then we have bones, and we have connective tissue, um, like fat, um, which make up another type of tissue. So here you can see that there are four main categories of tissue types. Okay? So we'll just put four categories of tissue. We'll put adult right, adult tissues, not embryonic, okay. Also found in children, but then they're, they're special, maybe put, let's try, we'll put specialized. Okay, specialized tissues. Okay, don't want to confuse you there. Okay, so the first type that we're gonna talk about is called epithelial. And epi this typically means when you see this word, it means a pawn, and thelio means layer. So this tends to be layers of cells. So this is um, tissue lining the inside of and outside of our bodies. Okay. And also the out side of the skin, so outer skin, sorry, outer skin, which is called the epidermis. So epidermis is the out, our outer part of our skin. Tissue also, epithelial tissue also, this is really important, it also um, makes up glands. And so the glands that we have in our body, like our salivary glands, like our mammary glands, like our sweat glands, those are all derived from epithelial tissue. So like salivary, sweat, and even the glands that um, are digestive in, in, in function. So even like the pancreas, would be a um, derived from epithelial tissue. Okay, so when we look at epithelial tissue, it is named based upon the shape of the cell. So for example, if the cells that make up the tissue are flat, it is said to be squamous. So this is flat. If it is shaped like a column, it is said to be columnar. So this would be like column shaped, like rectangular shaped. If it is um, a square, it is said to be cuboidal. So that would be equal, my cube's not quite equal, but that would be like a square, like a cube, equal sides, equal dimensions, okay? 
the columnar? Columnar, yeah. With the 3D, with, would that be like a cylinder though? Yes. Yeah. Or it could be like a cylinder. It could also so, be, it could be a flat side. Would a cylinder be more accurate than a rectangle? Yes. Um, it's a, a rectangular box. Because it could be, it could look like this. You know, it could have, uh, let's see if I can even do that. Like a milk jar. Yeah. Carton. Yes, milk carton, yeah. It could be like that. Yeah. But it could also be like a beaker. It could be like a beaker. Okay. Okay. We also have the number of layers. The tissue is said to be simple if it has a single layer. So simple would be a single layer. Stratified is many layers. Pseudo stratified. What does pseudo mean? False, right? So this is a single layer, but it looks like there's more. So it looks stratified, but it is actually a single layer. Generally, the reason why it looks stratified is because the nuclei are in different positions. So if I have my columnar cells like looking like this, right? If one nucleus is up here, one nucleus is down here, right? So for some reason, the nuclei are in different positions. Of the, in, it's still a single layer, but sometimes it looks stratified because the nuclei are at different levels. Okay, the other thing that we need to note when we look at epithelial tissue is, is it ciliated? So ciliated with a question mark, okay? So cilia are part of the cytoskeleton. So this is part of cytoskeleton. And this generally creates movement. So like in the female, our oviducts um, help to, they actually have cilia, and they actually help to move the egg down after it's been picked up and after it's been ovulated by the ovary as it moves down towards the ovary, the, the embryo, right? So this creates movement. It also is found in our trachea because our trachea produces mucus, and um, this mucus has to move up because we don't want it moving down and getting deeper into the lungs it's actually moved up and coughed up and it moves out of the respiratory tract because of the cilia okay so for example we could say that something is uh some epithelial tissue is stratified squamous and because I don't have the cilia on there, it's not ciliated, okay? So this would be the epidermis. This is protective. We have many, many um, layers of dead skin cells that are produced by the bottom of the epidermis. And so when we scratch our skin, for example, we don't do damage. Um, we would um, just simply scratch off the layers of the epidermis, right? So when you exfoliate, when you rub yourself with a cloth, for example, you're removing some of the layers of your epidermis when you do that. Okay, versus something like simple squamous, right? Which is not protective. Right? but allows diffusion to occur easily. So this would be, for example, our respiratory membrane in our lungs. Okay, 
So the respiratory membrane in our lungs is a single layer, and we're gonna look at this, the, this um, part of our lungs is actually called the alveoli. So we're gonna look at this in, in lab today, the alveoli. The respiratory membrane is in the alveoli, and we want that membrane to be very thin, and we want it to have a lot of surface area so that a lot of oxygen can diffuse from the atmosphere and be picked up by our circulatory system and transported out to our cells. <coughs> so that's simple squamous epithelial tissue. Okay. So in your book, they show the different layers, the different types. We could have simple cuboidal, we could have stratified cuboidal. Oops. Too much. Okay, so like in your small intestine, we have a simple columnar, right? We can also have stratified columnar, and then this would be the pseudostratified. So notice that the nuclei are at different levels, which make it look like it might be stratified, but it's not. So notice that the outline of the cells is just one cell thickness. Okay, so um, we also have junctions between cells, and this could be important um, with epithelial tissue. It can also be important between muscle cells as well. So we can talk about the different types of cell junctions. So this would be the connections between cells in a tissue. Okay. So one type of connection is called a tight junction. And this actually prevents, this actually connects cells really well and prevents substances from moving through the tissue layer, okay? So we'll say that proteins bind cells together and prevent substances from moving through the layer, the tissue layer. So for example, um, like uh, for example, we want our um, cells in our digestive tract to not be leaky. Sometimes you hear leaky gut. What is a leaky gut? Well, that means that you've actually damaged your epithelial tissue in your digestive system. And sometimes you bleed, like if you have celiac disease. Sometimes water can come out so that can cause diarrhea. So we want there to be a tight junction be between the cells so substances cannot move out. Right, so that's important in some particular tissues. It's also important in our skin because one of the functions of our skin is to prevent water loss, right? We don't want too much water evaporating. And so like if you have a third degree burn, one of the risks is, is that you're going to become dehydrated because you're gonna start to lose water to the environment. You're just gonna, water is just gonna um, leave through um, that damaged skin. So that's a tight junction. We also have what are called desmosomes. And these anchor cells to one another. Okay. So this can prevent like your skin from separating, the layers of the skin from separating so that we can absorb some mechanical energy and our skin does not rip, right? So there are certain proteins that kind of anchor skin cells together. There are also proteins that anchor muscle cells together so that when the muscle con tissue contracts, one cell will pull on another one and the whole tissue will contract, okay? So this prevents separation of, of cells. <coughs> So those are called desmosomes. And then finally, we have what are called gap junctions. 
where we have protein channels between cells. This allows substance to move from one cell to another. So for example, um, cardiac muscle cells in the heart are connected to one another by gap junctions, and this actually allows the flow of ions from one muscle cell to another so that that contraction moves like a wave through the heart. And so um, that is another important connection between cells. So even though they're tissues, right, they, the, the cells can be tightly bound to one another, right, to make a protective, could be protective, could also be um, a group of cells that are contracting in conjunction with one another. So in your book, they go into a little bit more detail about um, anchoring types. This is a type junction. Actually, this is a different diagram. I couldn't get that diagram from your textbook to copy over. This just shows that there's tight proteins that connect cells and that nothing could move through the space between the cells. This shows the desmosomes, the anchoring of one cell with another. And then this shows the gap junction, which actually creates a hole through which substances can move directly from one cell to another. So these types of um, cells, um, junctions, are important when we talk about different types of tissue. OK, so let's look at glands. OK, so I'm going to put the, again that these are derived from epithelial tissue. <laughs> And we can classify glands as being unicellular versus multicellular. And really, we only have one type of unicellular gland in our body, and that is called a goblet cell. And I believe it's called goblet because it kind of looks like it's shaped like a glass, like uh, something you drink a wine glass out of maybe, or a goblet. And um, the goblet cell specifically produces mucus. So think about um, our digestive tract, like our stomach, would have, in the epithelial tissue, would have goblet cells because it's producing mucus, because the mucus protects the stomach from self-digestion, okay? So in stomach, protects against acid. It's called the mucous membrane, okay? In the respiratory tract, it uh, traps foreign particles. So it could trap bacteria, and hopefully you'd be able to then cough up the mucus. Sometimes mucus, if you get excessive mucus in the lungs, you can't cough it all up, and that can actually be a breeding ground for bacteria, like when you get pneumonia. But generally, the respiratory tract, like the mucus in your nasal cavities, that's all produced to help to trap foreign particles to keep it out of the respiratory, out of the lungs. We also have multicellular glands. And some of these glands secrete their products via exocytosis. So they secrete products, oops, products, via exocytosis, okay? So for example, if we look at sweat glands, sweat is actually really interesting because it contains not just water, but it also contains substances in solution. So it contains water. Sweat can be salty. Sweat can also have hydrogen ions in it, right? Our sweat tends to be acidic. 
because um, the sweat um, protects us against bacterial infections, bad bacteria, so it can be acidic. And it can also have antibodies in it. And it can also release urea. So urea is a waste product of like protein digestion. This is what is found in our urine. Okay. But urea can be converted by bacteria into ammonia. So if you've ever sweated in gym clothes and then forgot to wash them, and you sniff them and they're like, whoa, that's ammonia, right? That's because your sweat had our urea in it. And then the bacteria in the environment started breaking down that urea and producing ammonia. And then you get ammonia, right? And so the way to take care of that is to put vinegar in your laundry, right? Because that will neutralize the ammonia, right? And um, help to take the smell out. The urea is also in our sweat. Okay. We also have some um, glands that break up. So they secrete pieces of themselves. So secrete pieces of cells. And an example of this is called a sebaceous gland. And what is sebaceous glands? What do they produce? Sebum, but it's also oil, right? So these are associated with hair follicles. This is also what produces blackheads and whiteheads, and sometimes pimples when they get infected. So what happens is, is that the sebum is produced, and it actually just pieces of the cell, there's pictures of this in your book, pieces of the cell just break off. And this is really important because it lubricates the skin, and it keeps it from cracking, right? So it's really important. It's like oiling your, you know, your leather shoes or your leather boots, right? So this lubricates the skin lubricates hair and skin. Okay. And so if you don't have enough sebum or if you constantly wash it off, like if you wash your hands excessively, right, they'll start to get dry. And then if they get too dry, they'll crack at the knuckles, right, and you'll bleed, right? And so that's because you don't have enough oil in your skin to lubricate it and the, the skin starts to crack. So that's sebaceous glands, okay? And those are multicellular glands. So these are both types of glands that are called exocrine glands. So I'm going to write exocrine next to them. And an exocrine gland is a gland that secretes its substances via a duct. So I'm going to put it secretes substances via a duct. We do have in our bodies endocrine glands. So put endocrine gland here. These secrete their substances directly into the, the circulatory system. And they uh, produce hormones, right? So they are hormones. So whenever you're talking about a gland that produces a hormone, it is always an endocrine gland. Hormones do, are not delivered via ducts. So like our salivary glands are, are exocrine because they are delivered via ducts to our mouth. Our pancreas has endocrine function because it releases insulin into the circulatory system. Our ovaries and testes also have part, are also part endocrine glands because they produce steroids. Right? Our adrenal glands are part endocrine because they produce stress hormones. Okay? So examples of this would be um, uh, pancreas producing insulin.
Now the pancreas also has an exocrine function because it produces enzymes as well that are transported. The hormones is an example of substance that is being It is the substance. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Insulin is an example of a hormone. Okay, so the pancreas produces insulin. Um, also things like what I say, ovary and testes produce steroids adrenal glands can produce stress hormones okay. so those are endocrine glands okay so i think i'm going to stop there for today and um, in lab, we're going to actually talk about some of the other examples of tissues. So it's epithelial, connective, nervous, and muscle tissue that we're going to look at today in lecture. Or excuse me, today in lab.